everyone joining us. Thanks everyone for joining. And uh, we're here in Brussels, um, three computers in one room, which is way overload. Um, I'm going to give an update. And so uh, the title of the talk is Progress on Systems Changes Learning, uh, Co-Evolving Towards Rethinking Systems Thinking. Um, the Rethinking Systems Thinking was a uh, the theme of the ISSS 2012 meeting uh, when I was president. And uh, there's a paper in Systems Research and Behavioral and Rethinking Systems Thinking. Um, three years ago, we started a project in Toronto called Systems Changes Learning uh, in the System Changes Learning Circle. And so uh, my colleagues on this, uh, we've divided into two teams. Uh, Zad Khan and I are on the scholarly team and Dan Ng and Kelly Okamura are on the field team. And the reason that we've done that split is that part of the challenge we've had with systems thinking is people getting into it from the novice uh, beginner standpoint. Uh, there's a lot of misleading systems thinking today. And so the challenge has been, can we actually get something authentically systems thinking that solves the issues that people are looking at today? And with that, um, would we be able to uh, also be um, theoretically well-grounded? And so the, the agenda is uh, for change learning is first reorient the attention of the people. Um, and so I'm, I'm gonna cover not all of the agenda. Uh, I've got three rows and three columns here. Um, the main start for this will be the first row on educating of attention. Um, and then uh, we'll go, may get through some of um, the learning for competence and we probably won't get through the learning for mentoring for really quick, um, but uh, we'll cover as much as we can and we'll stop and we can have discussions afterwards. But part of this is exactly the way that we see novices coming into system changes learning is firstly, why would you care? Uh, it's educating of attention. Secondly, the learning for competence. Well, okay, now that you actually care and you wanna take a different perspective, how is it you would actually come up that curve and practice it? Um, and if you were practicing it, it doesn't necessarily mean that you're an expert, but you'd understand enough about the tools and the techniques that you would actually use that. The third level is learning for mentoring and we get to the mentoring level, then we're looking at all of the philosophical foundations underneath. And uh, that's a curve that uh, within the team, we already have tensions uh, between the field team and the scholarly team. So I'm gonna start off uh, and, and the, the columns are following uh, the Greek um, philosophies of praxis or the development of practice, theoria, theory, thesis, uh, which is making and poesis would tend to be methodology uh, also, it is part of the design practice that we'd be looking at. So that's it's it really interesting. We start making the differentiation between practice and making uh, as two different things, but there's some fine points there. And so I'll step through those a little bit. So the first two slides. So thinking about systems change um, and uh, uh, Zad had led a session at the RSD session, uh, RSD uh, symposium uh, on Friday where we talked about theory of change, uh, systemic design thinking and systems changes learning. And so when we're thinking about change and systems change, are we thinking too anthropocentrically? And so the test that we've actually had with the team is, well, how would a beaver think about this? A beaver builds homes, uh, they channel things. And so, you know, we, we get into the questions of nature. So is it our human nature to be doing things? Are we too wrapped up in ourselves? And well, what happens to a beaver? Well, it turns out that beavers are extremely irritated by the sound of running water. And so whenever they have a break in the dam, they go and they fix it. Um, and you, you say, well, is that, you know, how do you understand that? Uh, is that something that is built into their nature? And you don't blame them for that. That's just the way they are. So with that, we also have the behavior behavioral view and the ecological view. And thinking about systems thinking, um, ecology is not what people think it means. If we go back to the history of, of um, ecological uh, of psychology, there was originally behavioral psychology, the Pavlov's dog ringing the bell. And what they were trying to do there was figure out what's inside your head, what's going on inside your head. So the way we understand a whole 
is to understand what's going on inside the dog's head. Uh, we can compare that to the ecological approach to perception. Ecological approach to perception was created by J.J. Uh, Gibson. And what he was looking at was how aircraft will land on a uh, aircraft carrier that's floating on the ocean that's in motion at the same time. And so that is looking outside of your head, what your head is inside. And so keeping these two perspectives, we find that often when we're doing a lot of the uh, systems changes orientation work, people are thinking, oh, well, if we can just change people's mind, we will change the system. And you go, no, that's not going to do it. That's the behavioral approach. There's also an ecological approach, which is there's an outside world that's happening. And when you change that, then you can, they might have a, a hope of changing the, the world, but uh, that's a big call. So the second idea is on changeless or temporality. Uh, and this is on the um, uh, education of attention and theory. There's two ways of seeing nature. And I borrowed a lot of this from David Hawk, um, my friend uh, who, who's uh, been working on this for a while. But the, the, essentially we go back to the basic foundations of philosophy. Um, if we take the Greek approach, there is reality is a change in the state. Uh, we talk about um, Parmenides, and we talk about shift, stability, and sustainability, and we're taking an analytical paradigm. An analytical paradigm is taking things apart. You're looking for universals. But in effect, the main idea is the only thing that is real is things change. The other alternative is reality as a state of change, not a change of state. And this is from Heraclitus. Um, and we have the beauty of dynamics and you have a contextual appreciation. So the idea that you never walk in the same river twice. Now, this is a dividing point and most of us, including myself being Western trained are trained on the left side. We're more oriented towards change in the state. So if we're talking about something like systems change, it's like, are we talking about a state and then we change to a new, another state and that's changelessness there? Um, and that's problematic we're, if we're talking about change we want to stick. Um, the, often the people talk about, you know, we have scalability issues. And it's like, well, you change the small system and I try to get a big system, but you're trying to make them static in some way. So changing the philosophy is a challenge when we start moving from the left side to the right side. And this moves us towards process philosophies, uh, processual views of the world. And it actually is somewhat easier in... Um, in the classical Chinese philosophy. So this, there are ways of bridging over this. And as an example, I could talk about the idea of dwelling. Um, dwelling is something that came out of Heidegger, for those of you who read about uh, Heidegger and building. Um, and, uh, but it's been um, updated. I rely here on uh, Tim Ingold's work. He has a book from 2000 called Temporality of the Landscape. And so uh, one of the things that we do in system thinking class is one of my questions I ask you, we have function structure process, uh, which comes first function structure or process and which comes first structure or process. And the idea of process comes first because even a mountain changes. And so here we have a flowing river, you can see that as a landscape, but people still tend to think that as a static sense. When you add on temporality, here we have an image of biking down a, uh, a slope um, all of a sudden you get into the idea of taskscape, which is the humans are in the system and they're involved. And this happens over time. Um, in, in the end, you're looking at temporal, temporalizing the landscape. And uh, Tim Ingold actually says, maybe we should stop looking and maybe we should start listening. And um, listening is something that doesn't happen at a point in time. It happens over a period of time. So your view of this changes a lot. Getting over onto the idea of, uh, of um, Chinese philosophy, uh, there's a fundamental idea of Wei or Wu Wei, um, and there's always a problem in translation, but let's take Wei as willful action and take Wu Wei as non-obtrusive action. And the question would be, can we get to, uh, and we're talking about natures of systems, should we be actually working on the non-obtrusive action? Because if a system has a nature, then wouldn't it be easier to follow the nature of the system rather than fighting to change a system with willful action? This leads us to questions as whether people actually have systemic and systematic um, confused. And 
systematic, we looked at somatic change. And so when you uh, climb up a mountain and you have problems breathing, you adapt to that, but you actually don't make gen genotypic change when you climb up a mountain. You have to wait, you can have a child at the top of the mountain and that child would be able to get raised at a different level. But there's a difference in systematic, which happens in a sequence and systemic that happens in the whole. We also get the change from non-living effect producing allopoietic um, uh, reproduction and living systems and, and, and people use the word autopoietic a little bit too much and don't understand what it means. So a living being that reproduces itself, um, having children is autopoietic. If you, if you have a machine and the machine produces something different, so a production line at the end, you've got an automobile or something else, that's allopoietic. So there's difference between systematic there and systemic. And finally, you have the idea of systematic about being reactive versus being co-responsive because if you have a living being, it's not like talking to, talking to a wall. You actually have the two parts responding together. So I'm gonna to turn to the second um, dimension, which is second section on learning for competence. And that was the backdrop for how we think about things differently. Just so, you know, if you're interested about systems change and you're okay with this, then we'd move to the next step. And moving to the next step, we now have, in effect, coaches or guides, and this is Dan and Kelly on the, uh, on the field team, who are trying to get people learning. So we work through the practice three empoiesis again. So system changes learning authentically depends on knowing from within appreciated through four movements. Uh, on the right side is formality. I've been working object process methodology, which is a rigorous tool that systems engineers use. And it makes a differentiation between information and physical and whether the influence comes from the environment or from uh, the system itself. Um, so uh, you can ignore that for the most part. Let me step through the, um, the five circles here. So on the center, we have knowing from within. And here's an interesting question about systems changes. If you're actually serious about systems changes as opposed to just changes, then there is a system. And you ask, well, why doesn't the system change? And the question would be, does the system know it's supposed to change? Knowing from within, now this doesn't necessarily mean it's a cognitive thing, it could be a feeling. It doesn't have to be rational. But the idea of knowing from within, um, this knowing from within is actually a term that, um, uh, that is used by Tim Ingold means that the system is going to change because it's internalized sort of thing. And we're talking about learning. Learning happens inside that system. Now, going north, uh, we have the, the shifting contextual influences. This is the external world. So, of course, we have the external world that is changing as the system itself changes, and you've got that um, that balance happening, that, that co-respondence where the system, knowing from within, responds to the outside. And the uh, system itself at the center could be an individual, it could be a group of people. Maybe we'll go back to talking about the beaver again. Does the beaver know that the, uh, the dam is breaking? Um, from there, uh, so now we've got both the uh, internal behavioral view and the external uh, ecological view. We work around the circle. And the way that we've been approaching this, because uh, we're trying to again make this understandable, is that we uh, emulate uh, medical practice or social work when we're working with groups. And so the first thing we do is diagnose the rhythmic disorders. Uh, we'll explain the rhythmic disorders a little bit later, but the diagnosing, people kind of understand that. You know, would you go to a doctor? So if you're knowing from within, how, would, would you, how do you decide whether you're gonna go to a doctor or not? If you're sick, you feel sick, no one else is gonna know, but you decide to go to a doctor or not. And so diagnosing is something that the doctor can help you with. It's actually a communications thing where you agree with the doctor or you may disagree with the doctor and say, I want a second opinion. I wanna go try a different approach. After the diagnosing, we have a prognosing of likelihoods of things that will happen in the future. A prognosing turns out when we are looking at the medical literature is they don't spend enough time with, uh, in medicine figuring out the prognosis. Um, I recently had a, a minor ailment. My, uh, I had some swelling in my, my foot. Um, and I've never been able to diagnose what the swelling in my foot is. However, I do know that in about a week, it goes away. So good prognosis, really bad diagnosis. It's like, okay, I don't need to go see a doctor about that. Uh, but the likelihood is that the, you know, my body will, will heal itself and go away. And then the third wouldn't be the actual action, which is reordering pacing. And this gets into um, hierarchy 
hierarchy, uh, sharing layer sorts of approaches, and whether you are actually doing something that is within the system itself, um, or it would be a major, major change where you're rearranging the world. So that's the basic sort of thing. And the, the question would be, you know, can we get people who are new to system change learning to accept this much and go, okay, I kind of understand what you're doing, we'll go to the next step. Now, this is where it starts getting a little tricky. Uh, because we're dipping into traditional Chinese philosophy. Um, and um, the way that I'm going to describe it is that typically in the West, when we look at change, we look at it as a single thing. I'm going to propose that. Can we look at it as a... So there's two things happening, not one thing happening. And this is good because if you have a system, a system has synergy and it has parts and those two things combined together. So let's take an example of farming, which is a traditional original foundations of uh, traditional Chinese medicine. So what we have the dyad is in the sky above, you've got warming and drying and in the soil below, you've got coiling, cooling and watering. And th that's how they do it. And so the combination of sun and earth and then in the middle, you've got the seed and all these things happening. You generate veg uh, vegetation in the contextual synergy. And the way that I've drawn it here is that we shouldn't think about this at a single point in time. We want to think of it over time. And so the sun comes in and the sun sets, uh, the, the earth warms, the earth dries out. And so you have the cycle of from the sky above and the earth below, and the two of them in the middle in, uh, combined in that contextual synergy of the system of interest, which we'll take as the farm, and things grow on the farm when you plant them or they don't grow on the farm. Um, so we're hoping that uh, people kind of go, okay, kind of got it. Uh, the challenge will be as we're working through this, and the next slide is our same image, but it is um, a different way of expressing in the headline. What we want to do is di diagnose the pathology because people are only interested in doing the systems change if there's a pathology of some sort. Can we first identify the two rhythms in the relationship that generate synergy? Now, this is actually a pretty tough call. It actually requires some thinking. And so I have sympathies for um, my colleagues, uh, Dan and Kelly on the field team, because now in order to guide people, what are two rhythms you could think about? Because this is actually dyadic and it's not dualist. And I'll get into that in a moment, but the Chinese philosophy is actually dyadic and not dualistic. So from that, you then expand that out and you have four cases. So it, it, normally when we look at it from a Western point of view, there'd be the case of, okay, things are fine. You know, we're normal, uh, you know, so we're healthy in a certain way. And, you know, the, the farm is doing well, it's going up and down. But there are four cases where you could see there in the upper left, uh, there's overheating and over, or over drying. And what happens is in effect, it's too hot. The sky is too hot. And it's not a problem if the sky is normally too hot if the earth can absorb that energy, right? So you've got this balance between the two. So normally we would be dealing uh, most of the, if we, if we believe in the normal world, we're dealing in that center part. But what happens is that when we move beyond that, it's like, okay, now we're looking for ways of correcting from these other alternative rhythms because the rhythms are out of sync. Um, expressing that again, uh, these are for the people who end up coaching on this. We're looking for the pathology, and pathology, if you go back to the original uh, etymology, uh, pathos is suffering, logos is the study of suffering, so we're in, in again, that medical sort of, um, of uh, mode, um, and we're trying to, uh, looking for pathology in the contexture. Now, contexture, um, this comes from um, research that um, and, and Susu and Yi Hung were, were, uh, got this article uh, handed back to them where the Germans were saying, well, context, you don't mean that. And, and they're saying, no, this is what the meaning of context is. Um, when we look at the systems definitions, context is, text is not about written text. It is about texture. And so what, I, what we should actually be using correctly, and I'm doing here for emphasis, is contexture. We're looking at contexture about how all these things come together. Um, so again, there's some learning behind that. Again, uh, the, the trick at this point would be 
we're kind of at a paramedic nursing level, you know, so you're just trying to get people and you might need to go to the hospital. You might not need to go to the hospital, but you know, this is the approach we use. Do you want to go not? And some people go, no, no, this is too far out. Like I can't understand the dyadic and stuff like that. Okay, that's fine. We can work with you, but there may be people who are curious about working in the dyadic. Okay, so this is the, uh, we're up to F, we're up to the uh, end of the second row. And, uh, and the question would be, well, how do we think about the methods as we, um, as we work on these? And now I'm leaning on the work of Ian Mitroff. And Ian has some interesting work and uh, his favorite quote is, if they can get you asking the wrong questions, they don't have to worry about the answers. So the big problem we have now in epistemology is not whether it's true or not true in the sense of you know, getting better. We actually get into uh, beyond the type three errors where we trick ourselves where we're solving the wrong problems into type four errors where people are tricking us and misleading us specifically for their own agenda. And so um, how do we get around that? Uh, um, and so this is a, a multi-paradigm approach that we, that comes from the open innovation learning research that was in my dissertation. And so we ex I ex extended that now, but the way, easy way of expressing this is we, ha we have five questions or five ways of learning. Uh, learning which, uh, which ends up being, well, which systems are you talking about? Which changes are you talking about? Learning what? Learning why? We have a learning whom, when, where, and then a learning how. And traditionally what happens when a lot of people do systems change work is they jump to the how. And it's like, no, uh, we need to do these five questions. And as a matter of fact, we need to do them in this sequence. Now, expanding this out into detail, the learning which is learning which shifts matter. You don't go to the doctor for everything. So in so, even if it's a small sort of ailment, it's kind of like, okay, I can live with it. The prognosis is I will get better in a week, whether, you know, it's, you know, you could take, you could take Tylenol and you'll be better in a week, or you can take, not take Tylenol, you'll be better in a week. So um, but learning which shifts matter is, uh, is a focus that people need to work on. The second then is learning what rhythmic disorders prevail. Uh, and so this starts getting into the, the quest to actually think about whatever the pathology is. Is it really a pathology? Is it something that will, uh, will be a short term sort of thing or a longer term sort of thing? Will it persist? Will it go away? Uh, number three, you get into how the prognosis is preferred or not preferred. Um, and some people may say, well, okay, you know, I, I understand I have the disease, I'm just going to live with it. Um, and they prefer not to take action, which is their choice. It's because uh, it's knowing from the inside. Uh, the fourth of knowing who and where, when you talk about resets, and this gets into, again, the shearing layers approach or the hierarchy approach, do you want to handle these sorts of things at the level you're at, or do you actually want to, in effect, change your change? Well, if we take it in the uh, shearing layer sense, are you in the room? Do you want to rearrange the furniture in the room, or is it you actually want to start moving the walls and changing the, uh, the roofing and the structure of the house and the plumbing and all these other things? Because people go, oh, no, no, I didn't want to, you know, the system change I wanted, I didn't want to rebuild a new house. Well, then you're asking for a different question. And then finally, the learning how on new ways become everyday practice. Uh, this takes us into uh, disclosing new worlds in Heidegger and how people disclose new worlds. Because some people, when you're learning from within, they will see the change and they'll see that it has to happen. Other people will not see that change and then they'll have to um, go, go from there and um, learn through reproduction social practice and uh, structure and things like that. Um, just to fill out, again, I'm doing this rigorously in object process methodology, which says that the ovals are processes and the rectangles are actually objects. And so uh, associated with each process, if we're following this method, there is an artifact that comes out of it. So there's five processes that you have in, in doing system changes learning, and there's five artifacts if you're doing it as a consulting project or advising on it. Okay, so we're two thirds of the way through. Uh, do we continue? Do we stop? Five minutes. Um, okay, so I think I will just pick a few things. I'm going to skip slides. Um, uh, let me come here. Um, philosophically, here's an interesting um, question. Now we're down at the philosophical level, and we have more discussion about this afterwards. Um, but we are talking about embodied becoming. 
knowing from within and corresponding across contextures. So the, uh, the um, in, in this sense, you can see it's following the philosophy at the bottom, it says that Tim Ingold said, knowing is movement. Um, so if, if we're looking for change, we have to presume that all everything is moving, everything is changing. And then the question is, what do you pay attention to? Um, and of course, the ground that we're in, or if we're in the water in this sense, makes a difference on how you approach that. Um, the way that we've been expressing some of these in terms of priorities, because if you're talking about attention, is you can't do everything. We've been doing this um, interesting um, two by two matrix about uh, local versus distant and urgent versus important. And so if we talk about having a medical incident um, in the lower right, uh, if it's local and it's urgent, it could be like you're on the battlefield and you need to have the medics come right away. You need to solve it right there. Um, the alternative would be uh, going north and having it, uh, they're expediting a trauma emergency. So you actually take them to an emergency room. And if you go to the uh, southeast here, um, we have, if it's important, and local, we have neighborhood clinics. People go and typically neighborhood clinics and they take care of things there. And uh, then we have the, uh, the distant and the um, uh, important, which is like an operating surgery. And so the problem we have, we had in using this so far, people actually have a real challenge separating out the urgent from the important and they get the confused. And what often happens is that we work only on the urgent and we're not focused on the important. And the important and the distant, which is something like climate change, is really a problem because it's like, okay, like how often would you schedule an emergency room? Like, do you really want to go there? You know, it's scary. You haven't been there before, these sorts of things. And so just working through, um, Kelly and Dan had worked through this um, at last year's RSD meeting, and we had a workshop on it, and uh, we always get stumped on this. So... Um, with that, I'm going to uh, wrap up and I'm going to um, turn off my headset and then we should actually be able to have some uh, conversation.